Well, I, I hope everyone had a very productive day and uh, I'm looking forward to all the questions and comments and interacting with you uh, via World Wide Web. So who am I? I'm a dentist. I like to do cosmetic dentistry. been doing it for 28 years and been lecturing on it for 28 years all around the world. So I've got a fair amount of, uh, you know, trial and error and practice under my belt, as well as a few accolades and things that I've achieved over the years, as far as becoming a fellow and whatnot within the AACD. So I'm pretty good at answering questions and I'm sure you have a few. So knowing that I'm no different than you, I'm a dentist. I've just chosen to spend a lot of time studying cosmetic dentistry. So what I want to do tonight, a little different. I'm, I'm definitely not the typical dentist. I'm definitely not the typical, lec typical lecturer, but I want you to think of something. I want you to think tonight. I don't want you just to sit here and listen. I want you to actually make a change or do something different. You know, you obviously, you come here with questions potentially or concerns or desires. And unless you ask questions, you can't fix those. So I'm hoping you'll take the time to ask. And so I threw up these two words, what if? Kind of random, right? What if? Two of the most powerful words you have in your arsenal, as far as I'm concerned. What if? That's right, words. And when you actually see the power in implementing these words into all that you do, you can become unstoppable. Everything you dream of or hope of or desire, you can have. And here's why. You see, our brain is what allows us to be successful or what allows us to be comfortable. And anything you want in life, you know, if you're committed enough, you can go get it, right? But most of us are comfortable. We want to just stay where we are. We don't want to rock the boat. Let's take it a step further. When you write things down, things that you want, your brain tells you you can achieve these things when you write them down. How do I know? Well, research has shown that if you write down what you want, in other words, a goal, you are 42% more likely to achieve it. But guess what? Only 1% of people write down their goals. And it's no wonder why people never achieve their goals and keep wishing, hoping, and desiring to have things. So the question to you is what? What do you want? What do you want out of this program tonight? What do you want to learn? What do you want to see? What do you want to know? What do you want to change in your business? Right? And from there, if you have the knowledge, you can become more successful. Successful. If you have the knowledge, you can do more cases. If you have the knowledge, you can make more money. It's that simple. With any problem in life, what if? Those are two questions I would always ask of whatever the problem is. Now, why do I throw that in? Well, A, because as dentists, we have problems, questions, or concerns, and patients also have problems, questions, and concerns. So the better you can communicate with them, the more likely you are to be successful. So to create the best possible outcome, you've got to be a great communicator. Because honestly, at the end of the day, the procedure is pretty easy. Now, granted, if you haven't done many of them, you're saying, maybe, no, it's not. It's not easy. Well, is that because fear? Because you haven't done enough to feel like you've, you've got enough repetitions under your belt to be successful? Or is it you're not confident just because you haven't done any or you've only done one or two, or maybe the one or two you did didn't have the best outcome, which is no different than, you know, like the first amalgam filling you did in dental school, right? It probably took three hours and had scratch lines for anatomy, the same as mine did. So I want you to think, as Napoleon Hill said, think and grow rich. You got to ask questions. So I want you to think tonight about what you want and why, and how you're going to apply the knowledge tonight when you get back into the office. I obviously don't do anything like anyone else out there. I'm, uh, I'm a little unique in that sense. Uh, unfortunately, I, I feel that many dentists typically do the same as many others. And so they tend to, oh, I, I guess, run into the same problems or have the same kind of outcomes that most dentists do. And you know, I obviously don't want that. So with the information I'm providing, obviously in two hours, you can't become an expert on veneers. But what it will give you is a head start or it might help where you have problems. And the only way you can create new habits and better outcomes is to start to implement things that I'm teaching you tonight. One of the ways we create habits is by doing something over and over again. And they say somewhere between 18 and 254 days, habits are formed. They say on average, it takes about 66 days. So with that being said, what is the first thing to do 
for a veneer case. Think about that for a second. What is the first thing to do for a veneer case? Yeah, there's no right or wrong answer, potentially. There could be a lot of different things. You got to decide what that system is. So if you're thinking about it, you're probably thinking dentistry. Okay, well, I got to take some impressions and I've got to you know, maybe take a Facebook or some photographs, right? It's usually the first place a dentist's mind goes. And I would say you missed a couple of steps. Here's why. You're running a business. And to run a successful business, no matter what type it is, you have to attract people. You have to attract consumers, people that are going to buy your goods, right? So if you want to be better at dentistry, cosmetic dentistry and veneers, you got to get more patients that want that procedure, as opposed to hoping someday you'll get a patient that walks in the door that wants them or an existing patient asks for them. And from there, you might get someone to come in, but if you can't get them to move forward, in other words, to say, yeah, I want what you're offering, or yes, I'm willing to pay your fee, whatever that is, if you can't do that, you're not converting people. And so the third part of what I consider the trifecta is delivery. And so most of the time as dentists, what do we focus on? Well, we focus on the delivery. We take continuing education to learn how to do more procedures, use more technology and deliver a better product or a different product. And yet it's not that often we talked about how we're going to get more patients into the office and move forward to do the procedures we want to be doing. So those are the first things you have to consider. So attracting, that's the first thing. I would tell you, you got to work on it. If you want to do more veneers, how are you going to get more people? That's one thing you're going to have to consider. That's the what. And if, if you can get more people to come into the practice, then you have to get them to convert. So what do you have to learn to get people to convert? What kind of communication skills do you have to find that are out there to get people to move forward? Because I can tell you, there's a lot of training and effort that can go into that. And once you accomplish these two things, Instead of hoping or waiting for things to happen, you can make things happen. You can create the type of procedures you want on a regular basis if you're good at attracting and converting. If you're not, well, then you're going to keep hoping and waiting that something shows up in your office. So I point these out because oftentimes we don't talk about these. We just talk about how to do veneers and I get people saying, well, I've never done one yet, but I, I kind of want to learn more about them or I don't feel comfortable yet. It's like, well, until you get more patients to have repetitions, you're not going to feel comfortable. And you're going to have trial and error. You're going to have failures and problems along the way. It's just inevitable for all of us when we're learning something new. So these are two things I would say you need to think more about how you're going to accomplish those. So as far as delivery, well, there's a lot of ways to deliver. We're going to talk about it tonight. This gentleman had someone deliver some veneers. Again, the question is, what did he want and did he get it? And so when you look at this gentleman, you know, kind of, I don't know, bulky, white, artificial looking teeth. And some people may love him. He obviously didn't. In a black and white photo, you can see the value is significantly higher than his teeth and they lack a lot of anatomy and texture and translucency. And so what steps were missed when whomever had done these veneers? What steps did they miss or not understand? Yes, the patient got veneers, but are they what he, what he wanted? Are they you know, pretty? Are they, are they nice? Those are the questions that one has to ask. So if we add color in, now you can see, wow, yeah, they're kind of bulky, white, chiclety looking things. So again, what steps was this dentist missing or potentially not communicating well as far as what the final product was supposed to look like? Hence the patient's upset and the patient wants something different. But guess what? This patient went somewhere else. And so in talking to this patient, having you know, a long conversation about what they wanted, they wanted something that just looked like their other teeth. And I said, okay, well, that's warmer. And it has all these funny translucencies and colors and things in it. And they have a little bit of texture. Is that something you want? And I said, look at your back teeth, all the little colors and things. He says, yeah, I just want it to look believable. I don't want anyone to know I have veneers. And I said, no problem. We can do that. So we can make some very thin feldspathic porcelain. Uh, restorations that look amazing and allow light to pass through them, you know, very realistic. But for the same token, if you get someone come into your office that wants veneers and you give them this and you didn't have communication, maybe us as dentists think these are amazing. I mean, my ceramics is world-class. So if a patient wants the Hollywood white smile, 
we're going to be missing out if we didn't communicate well. So hence, communication becomes extremely important. So how do we communicate? How do we get inside someone's head to show them what we can do and to see what's possible so that when we get done, they're excited and happy and they knew what they were getting before we ever got started. And so to make someone happy means you've got to spend time communicating. And if you can communicate well, the procedure actually is quite simple. And so if we're building in textures and various colors, it's a matter of looking at photographs. And it could be anybody's work. Go on Instagram, grab anybody's work and show it to patients. Say, hey, do you like this? Do you like that? You know, what do you have in your mind as far as what you like? And if you can show examples of things, then it becomes easy to start communicating what someone likes to your technician so that they can build something for you that meets that patient's desires. And so again, we may find this appealing, but patients may say, no, this is not what I want. This is warm. I don't like all the marks on the teeth. I don't like the funny colors in it. I want something more white and uniform, right? So that becomes a big conversation. At the end of the day, you're selling an emotion. What is that emotion when you get done? What is the outcome? Are they happy and you know, very pleased with the appearance that you've created for them? Or are they unhappy and want things changed? I can tell you there's a lot of people doing veneers nowadays, and I see a fair amount of people that come back in that are upset. And I think for the most part, it's due to a lack of communication. The patient had no idea what they were getting. And for the same token, the ceramist might not have known exactly what was desired to be built because, again, of the lack of communication. So with that, I kind of built this program based on a few different fundamentals. Yeah, the simple procedures of doing the dentistry but some of the concepts behind what we're doing and why, and if we get them done properly, we can get a great result. Now, obviously there's a lot more to it than just two hours, but I wanted to give you kind of the, the base information that you could take back to the practice and start doing well. So if you've got a patient that has come into the practice and is ready to move forward, obviously at that point, you're gonna do diagnostic models. You're gonna take records you know, like photographs and Facebook and maybe some bite registration. And so looking at a patient that comes in, you could simply take one set of impressions or multiple sets. It's up to you. And you can certainly scan them and then have the ability to make as many models as you want. I personally, I still take impressions. So I would take impressions such that I have three sets of models. So I have one set that is for my legal documentation, the same as the orthodontic community, that they set aside a set of models to show everything before anything was done that they can re refer back to over time. Now, the second set of models is for me to actually practice my preparation design. So I wanna actually go in and practice before I ever treat that patient, but I also wanna practice on it and show the laboratory what I'm thinking of doing. Because oftentimes the lab is going to take more to structure away than you are thinking you were going to do. And that means possibly that when they wax things back out, they may not wax it out as far as you were thinking it was going to be. And now you have a discrepancy in the thickness of the porcelain because of the preparation design that was performed. And you might have to redo something because the porcelain is too thin or it's too bulky or it has a show through. And so there has to be communication between you and the laboratory as far as what your intentions are. Now, from there, the third model is a spare that in case I was practicing on one of them and made a mistake, I got an extra one. Or if I need to make bleach trays, I can do it with that model as well. Now, from here, I've got models, but I need a face bow. I'm amazed in my practice how 28 years, no patient has told me they've ever had a face bow used. And so I'm assuming a lot of people aren't using them, but I can tell you it makes all the difference in the world. If you want things to go in properly, to have the least amount of functional interferences and problems that you've got to adjust and grind and try and make up for, use a simple face bow. Okay. Mounting that onto a semi-adjustable articulator. Oops, too many buttons. Mounting it onto a semi-adjustable articulator, I try to keep it on the same articulator or have one that's calibrated with the laboratory because surprisingly, not all articulators are the same, right? So they're actually calibrated. So usually I'll write down which one it's on and I'll set the incisal pin 
making it such that we can maintain the accuracy of these models coming together. Okay. From there, if I have this set aside to be given to the laboratory after doing my practice preparations, I also need photographs. So something like the AACD offers, you know, a complete series of photographs that I can look at, the laboratory can look at, and we can have a conversation about where we're going. Again, communication. If you're not doing this, then they're maybe going one direction and you're going a different direction and the patient's potentially in a third direction. So communication becomes critical at this point. Now again, photographs of other people's teeth can be utilized to help give information. So if someone comes in and says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with my teeth, we can all look at them. Where we want to go could be by looking at other examples of veneers from other ceramists or other dentists anywhere around the world. So obviously, if we're talking photography, you need a camera. And so if you don't have a quality camera, very hard to communicate. I see people using their iPhones, which is, don't get me wrong, it's a great phone in there, a great camera in the phone, but it's obviously not a professional grade camera that's going to take really great shots, close up that is. So, you know, whether it's a simple, inexpensive camera with a ring flash, whether you get a little more fancy and do, you know, some soft boxes on it, whether you want to set up a little, you know, portable studio or complete studio, I leave it up to each person. But in my mind, you need to have photography to communicate with a patient, with the laboratory, and to communicate to the public as far as marketing yourself. So you need photographs. It's inevitable that you're going to have to have these if you're not doing it already. Now, if you say, well, you know, I want something that's inexpensive and easy to use. Well, an iPhone is certainly one of them, but another one from Shofu is the iSpecial, uh, which does a great job of taking photographs. And that's the little white one here in the bottom corner, right? And so the girl that was sitting there, you know, here's her, her pre-op photo mug shot. We obviously wanted to look kind of bad because obviously the final always looks a lot better. And so we want that kind of thing. But the other great thing about a photograph is it allows us to show people possibilities to start having some communication. And so if you look at this digital mock-up, this is simply showing someone a new possibility. There's an infinite number of possibilities. But this patient just needed to see that their, her teeth were longer and whiter and said, yeah, that's what I want. Done. Let's move forward. So it's a phenomenal communication tool. Now, you and I could look at it and say, okay, well, I'd rather personally have a little more translucency or what have you. But we're trying to find out what makes her happy, not me as a dentist. And so these can be done on many people that walk into your office for simple things like cleanings or, you know, typical periodic exams or new patient exams. If you take a photo and you send it off to a company, I use Preview Dental. Uh, but if I send it off to company, I can get these back in like 45 minutes or less and show people a possibility. And so people come in for a hygiene visit and they're walking out and I say, here's your photo. What do you think? And they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea how bad my teeth had gotten. Yeah, let's have a conversation about how we can make my teeth look better. And someone else says, yeah, I've had braces a couple of times and I'm tired of it. I'm not happy with my teeth. I've got spaces and I don't like the shape of them. And it's like, okay, well, what about this? Does this make you happier? And if she says, yeah, that's a little better, I say, okay, great. We're on the right track. What else could we change about it? What don't you like about it? And so it becomes a communication tool. And so something like this for all of your existing patients can be phenomenal because research has been done that shows 50% of your patients are unhappy with their smiles and three out of five are willing to pay to get it changed. So you have an existing database of people that would like to have some kind of change to their smile. Now, in addition to that, in addition to photographs, we can have someone that comes into the office and if we have time in our schedule, you know, if we purposely built it in or if we had a cancellation, we can oftentimes do mock-ups on a patient to show them a possibility. Now, depending on how much time and effort you put into it, these things can look pretty amazing, but you know, time is money. So you go, okay, well, if I could freehand each tooth and you know, five minutes or less for each tooth, if I'm doing six teeth, that's half an hour. And then if the patient doesn't like something, then you're having to tweak and play with it more. So you can see where this could be quite time consuming. So if you build it into your schedule, you know, that's one thing, but also if you want to charge a fee for it, that's another. And so when I look at these, I say, okay, if I'm going to mock this up in someone's mouth, and I say, if, because it's not that often that I will do this, but if I were going to do this freehand, if I can't do it faster than about five minutes a tooth, then I need something else. 
Well, what else is out there? What can I use to give me a different approach? And so if I want to mock something up quickly like this, maybe I need some technology that can help me move forward faster. Right? So if I'm just sticking composite on the front of someone's teeth and, it, and I'm not really good at it, potentially I could grab one of these systems, this U-veneer from Ultradent, and I can put some composite in it, simply dry the tooth off, squish this down on the tooth like a cookie cutter, wipe off the excess and hit it with a curing light. And literally in less than a minute, I can have the shape of a tooth. So now instead of spending half an hour or more, I can be done in just a couple of minutes. So I've changed the dynamics as far as showing someone a possibility simply by having a different type of technology. Now, again, as I said, this is not something I do regularly. It's more of if I built time into the schedule for someone, or if I had a cancellation, I might do this. The majority of the time, I will approach this differently. If someone comes in and says, yeah, I want veneers, let's move forward. I typically do a wax up and the wax up, I then show the patient and depending on their case of where their teeth are, I can then show them a mock-up on their person from the wax up. So here's an example. Patient walks in and says, I want a veneer. I said, okay, he wants a veneer on number seven. And so as dentists, we all look at the wear and the discoloration and the, the height differences and the spacing. And you might scratch your head and go, I don't know if I want to do one veneer because trying to make all that match is not going to be easy. And the, the kicker is he doesn't want me to touch his tooth. He wants no preparation done to his tooth. So I'm like, okay, let's see if we can make him happy because if we can't make him happy, I'm not moving forward with the case. So how can we do this for him or anyone that comes in the office to try and show them a possibility other than a photograph? So right now it's all about communication. We, we mentioned you could do it in a photograph. We mentioned you could do it freehand. We mentioned you could use like a cookie cutter approach with the U veneer, or you can use provisional material in a wax up. So how do we do this? Well, obviously if you have a wax up, you can take an over impression of that wax up. And by doing so, you've got what looks like the tray on the right hand side with the purple material, right? So you have this that now is a duplication tool of that wax up into someone's mouth. And since this gentleman I was talking about said that we can't touch his teeth as far as doing any preparation design, it's going to be completely additive. We're adding to the front of his teeth. So depending on how much we add, at some point, it's going to look peculiar. But if there's a sweet spot where you can just add a little bit and he's happy with it, well, then obviously we could treat his case. So if we fill this over impression with some temporary acrylic and hold it over his teeth, if we allow that to set to completion after about three minutes time, it's hardened and kind of interlocked in between each tooth. And when I pull the over imp impression off, typically this is what I'm going to get. And so I call this a beadline provisional. And so this process will go through more, but what I'm pointing out here is the communication aspect. And so I'm showing the patient instead of one tooth where he wanted one, I'm showing him all six front teeth. Now, he had no idea that this was possible. He just saw one tooth. And as a dentist, I saw something different. And so I'm just simply showing him a possibility. It's up to him to decide if he wants this new possibility or if he still wants the one tooth. And so after showing him this, he's like, yeah, this is amazing. I want this. And so what I did at this point is I broke off the four, you know, central, lateral, and the canine. And then I broke off his canine on number six and left just the lateral alone and said, okay, here's what it looked like if we did what you had wanted originally. And I said, okay, now having seen both, you can understand why I'm recommending more. And he says, yeah, you don't have to tell me. I already saw it. And so there's a lot that goes into communication by speaking, but also into seeing something and seeing something on one's person, nothing compares. And so this, along with photographs, allow people to see something that none of us could ever understand or see on our own because we're not the patient. We don't have the same, you know, mindset that they have. And so exposing this and showing them is very important in moving forward with the veneer process. And so this is that same gentleman. I'm just showing you how we did literally a no prep, you know, temporary over his teeth. 
And since he wouldn't let me prepare his teeth, this is showing me how much space I have and what we could create. Now, if he wanted the canines to be more upright, we could certainly do that. If he wanted to think all this teeth longer, we could do that. So it was a conversation tool at this point to help guide where we're going. And so in talking to him about changing a few things to make it even better for him and his mindset, he said, well, if we're doing this, I want whiter and I want just a little bit longer. And I said, no problem. And so we did that for him. And so for you and I, we may or may not like this kind of appearance, but he's loving it. And that's what's important is figuring out what each person loves and making it for them. So communication becomes very important. And that realization allow you to move forward in your career a lot faster than trying to be perfect and ideal. Because a lot of times as dentists, we try to create this perfect kind of dentistry driven a final outcome, but not everyone wants that. And so ideally, we're doing something for that patient that they want, what's in their mind. We have to expose that. All right. So any patient that comes in, we've got to look at how we're going to prepare things. You know, so we have to give information to the laboratory to let them know where to go. And so we could spend many hours talking about smile design and preparation design. But at the end of the day, I'm going to give you kind of just a, a simple way to evaluate things. And so if you think of drawing an imaginary line across the front of these teeth, where is that imaginary line in their face? So if you had taken a photograph, you know, is this one tooth, and this example is tooth number eight, is number eight too far forward in their face when you look at them from the side or from the front? If it is, then that's a limitation where the tooth has to go backwards. If it's not, then that could be basically the point of reference as far as where we're starting, because you'll notice all the rest of the teeth are further back from it. So you have to make an assumption. And where do you start with your assumptions? You start with the limitation. The limitation is the tooth that's either too far forward or too far backwards. And then you start to play on them to determine how we can take the least amount of tooth structure off to get a desirable outcome. Or if we can't, then it's moving into either braces or a crown. And so that becomes informed consent and you know, risk benefit alternatives for the patient. Now take it a step further. Think of how good you could become if you started practicing on every model of every patient that came into your practice, whether they're doing veneers or not. Think of all the knowledge you could learn and obtain just by having impressions on numerous patients that come into your practice that you want to practice on. And so a couple of times a week, if you sat down in the laboratory and practice preparation design and working on models, you can imagine how good you'd get with time. And so it becomes a lot easier when you look at a case and go, oh, I can see this without even having to prepare it, but I, I can see mentally where we could go with this case to make it look better. Now, in addition, the more repetitions you do, the easier it becomes to be successful. And no longer do you have as many fears or concerns as far as stepping into a big veneer case. And so if you're doing this over and over again, you can imagine in 30 days time, you could be pretty good at prepping lease models for veneers. All right. So if we're finding the limitation, once we've found and defined what that is by looking at models and photographs of the patient, we can then start to look at the buccal corridor. And where's the limitation here? Are the teeth too far out buckle? Are they not far enough out? In other words, they're set in, so they have a narrow smile. And so looking at their photographs and looking at the symmetry, is there anything that needs to be built out laterally based on the model and the photographs and having the discussion with a patient when you're looking at them? And so all of this information derives kind of where we can go. And so you start to create kind of this mental imagery of, hey, if everything were ideal, and we had done veneers or let's say even braces, where would the teeth all line up as far as this kind of curvature in their smile? And when you look at that, you can see in this model that this blue line, if we said tooth number eight was in the ideal position, well, that means the other teeth around it, number seven, nine, and 10, really don't need much of any reduction because they need to be pushed out facially. So now we get to bond to enamel, which is our longest lasting bond and, and easiest to create uh, type of bond. And so with this kind of mindset and, and knowledge in front of us, we go, okay, well, really all I need to do 
is a little bit of a preparation on eight to make it on the same plane as number nine, and then maybe do a real fine kind of margin on tooth number seven, nine, and 10. So the ceramist knows where to stop. I personally like a slight prep as opposed to a no prep. Um, but nonetheless, you could see where, okay, very minimal preparation has to be done to the adjacent teeth. It's really just number eight. And then depending on how you extrapolate the smile, you may say, okay, well, maybe the distals of the canines need a little bit taken off. And maybe one of the premolars needs a little bit removed, tooth number five, maybe on the facial, and maybe number 12. Other than that, we can pretty much glue a half a millimeter, three quarter millimeter veneer on most of these teeth without even having to do much reduction. And yet oftentimes, if you Google veneers, you see teeth just destroyed to try and put some porcelain on. And so again, I think the goal is to do the least invasive procedure to create the best result and the best longevity. And in my mind, that's the least amount of dentistry being performed that looks believable, meaning minimal prep, which is what I've just kind of pointed out. So knowing that, if you're going to take just a couple tenths of a millimeter off certain teeth, you've got to communicate that. A uh, question just popped up. So in this hypothetical case, they said, what type of material are you going to use for this case? Well, to some extent, since I'm not really having to lengthen teeth much, and I'm not having to reduce teeth much, I'd probably do traditional feldspathic. Now, if the patient's teeth were worn down on the incisal edges and I was having to lengthen them for the same scenario, well, I'd probably want something a little stronger than feldspathic. So I'd look at doing some lithium disilicate. So either some Lisi from GC or an Emax from Ivoclar. Okay. Or if you like Glidewell, they have their obsidian, which is the lithium uh, silicate material. So there's a few different options there. But yeah, I would go to a stronger material if we had loss of incisal edges. But since we don't, I personally like feldspathic porcelain for something like this, especially since we're doing minimal to no prep kind of thing. And I want something very thin. All right. Next picture. There we go. All right. So as far as communication, we're talking about taking little amounts off in places and really being as precise as possible when we're talking about this example of a case. And so if I'm going to send this to the laboratory and I personally haven't done the reduction, then I'm going to take the time to communicate and write on here what I want done on each plane of the tooth if necessary, or if I'm trying to upright a tooth where a tooth needs to be reduced laterally. Or if the gum needs to be modified, I'm showing them that as well. So I'm trying to give them every ounce of information to give me the best possible result versus just sending it off and saying, hey, do some veneers for me. Okay. All right. So preparation design. If we're going to start preparing these models, we've got to understand some of the, the key principles in preparation design. So let's look here. We we'll call it an A, B, and C approach. An A approach is like the model work I had just shown you where the incisal edge is intact. Now you could say it has maybe you know, some slight chip out of it or something, but for the most part, it's intact. And so all we're really trying to do with a veneer of an A type is putting something on the front of a tooth to make it look different. So usually it's a very minimal change to the tooth, not a lot of color change and pretty simplistic in its approach. And one of the easiest ones to do. Now, if you said, okay, I've got someone that's got a fair amount of chips and or wear on the incisal edge, now I'm doing a different approach. Now I'm doing a style B, as in Bravo. And so you can see here, the facial incisal line angle has been reduced such that I have this rounded curvature where my new line angle, where the, the veneer stops, is the incisal lingual line angle. So it gives me the ability to lengthen the tooth slightly and change the appearance of that incisal edge. So whether it's worn slightly crooked, going maybe downhill from mesial to distal, or it has a few chips, or it's all rough and broken out, uh, I could use this approach if I'm not trying to lengthen it much. Now, if you say like many of our patients that walk in and they've got a lot of damage to their tooth where it's been worn down and maybe you've lost you know, two or three millimeters off the incisal edge, and you really need to lengthen things. Well, now I'm starting to switch gears. I'm saying, okay, well, because of the wear and damage, I'm probably not thinking feldspathic porcelain. I mean, you could, but I'm not thinking it since we've got stronger materials nowadays. 
I'm thinking I'll probably jump into some type of lithium disilicate, which as I said, is either Lisi from GC or like an Emax from Ivoclar. And in doing this C style approach, I'm basically going over the incisal edge, really just to polish it or smooth it if it has any rough irregularities, because the length that's been lost is my reduction. The tooth's already been reduced if I'm trying to lengthen it back to normal. Now my, my margin, I'm gonna wrap over the incisal edge and slightly down the lingual. I'm only really trying to go down just enough that I get some mechanical retention. I'm not trying to interfere with their existing occlusion. I wanna try and maintain all their occlusal stops as much as possible. So we're not trying to invade those areas. Now there is research that's out there that says, hey, instead of wrapping over the incisal edge, what about just doing a 90 degree off the facial straight back on the incisal? And research says that that will work. Here's my kind of thought process in it. I want to have some mechanical retention. So I'm not relying solely on glue. And I'm hoping that because I have mechanical retention that this veneer will last a lot longer. Now, there's plenty of research that also shows that the C-style that's been around quite a long time has worked fine. But based on each person's technique and thickness of materials and occlusion, I'm sure both can fail. Is it easier for the ceramist to make this style versus a 90 degree? No, I'd say the 90 degree is probably far easier on the ceramist. So really it becomes a communication between you and them and what your philosophy is. I personally like mechanical retention and we've been doing this one for oh, over 30 years. Now, if you look at it from a different angle, you'll notice instead of three, we now have four models. And so you can see the A style, the B style, the C style, where we wrapped over the incisal edge slightly. And then there's a D approach or a dog leg, basically, where we have the same incisal edge, but where we maybe have to extend through an interproximal area because of either a diastema or a rotational aspect or a black triangle. That's when we extend through a contact. Most of the cases, I try not to extend through the contact unless it's dictated by, again, either a rotated tooth, a diastema, or a black triangle. And we'll go into more of that in a moment. But I wanted you to see that for the most part, we try to do a dog leg around the contact. What do I mean by a dog leg? I mean that your margin at the gingival level extends back a little bit you know, underneath and slightly you know, behind the contact. So if I rotate this image a little more, you can see it from slightly different angles, where if you had to extend through a contact, you want to extend it back at least halfway through the tooth, so you get a natural emergence profile coming from the lingual to the facial. And then you can see it here upright. Now, these were models we used at UCLA when I was teaching the graduate program in cosmetic dentistry there. These are done by Harry Albers. I can't take credit for them, but they're a phenomenal teaching tool. So again, this type of preparation design is not something I came up with. It's been around for quite a long time. Now, my mentor at UCLA was Bruce Crispin. So I took a couple of images out of his textbook that we use for teaching. You'll notice here the A, B, and C style. And so you can see what I mean by wrapping over as far as a C. It's not a lot. It's not, you know, like a harsh 90 degree angle. There's not any sharp internal line angles. It's just enough to create a nice seating effect but also to make it such that it has mechanical retention from lingual forces when someone's biting or grinding or you know, chewing. Um, so you can see here uh, the incisal edges. That's why I was putting this in. Uh, a question just popped up. I, ex I said extend lingually when rotation, diastema, and they want to know what the third time was. The third thing is a black triangle. And so depending on your patients, you may see at the gingival level, the teeth maybe are still contacting, like maybe eight and nine still contact, but at the gum level, they got that little black triangle. And the only way to close that triangle down is to move the contact position. And so there's been a lot of research on this. If your contact from uh, bone to the contact is five millimeters or less, you can get a papilla to grow back into a black triangle. So sometimes you have to break a contact so that you can create porcelain going in a proximal to lower the contact to a place in which you can get gum tissue to grow back in. All right, great question. All right, so here's a couple more images out of uh, Dr. Christman's textbook. 
And so if you think of a case dogmatically, and I will tell you that I don't treat any case dogmatically, I think that's the wrong approach. I think all teeth need something different. And some teeth require no preparation. Other teeth require a lot of preparation. So I don't think there's a dogmatic approach. But as far as the concept of veneer, it's pretty straightforward. And when it first came out, we had, let's say, teeth in this picture, this diagram. Let's say that the patient's been through braces and their teeth are in a great position. The whole purpose of preparation design is to make space for porcelain, right? So if you said imaginary dotted line is where the tooth was, and we took off, let's say, half a millimeter of tooth structure, we're still in enamel. And you'll notice in approximately, we took the same amount of weight there, right? So we have a uniform level of thickness. And if we don't take that same amount of weight in approximately, you get teeth that are swedged together that look like piano keys. So you have to make sure, excuse me, you extend in approximately, or not, inter, not breaking the contact, but you can see they've gone into the proximal area to reduce a little bit of tooth structure, okay? So in a perfect world, we're trying to create some amount of space to create ceramic. Now, back when we were... You know, doing this type of approach, you know, we could, for the most part, it was all feldspathic porcelain. And so we could lay up feldspathic porcelain down to about half a millimeter without a problem. Obviously, with time, we've gotten better to make feldspathic porcelains down to a couple tenths of a millimeter. Uh, you know, literally thin ice chips is what they look like, uh, depending on your ceramics capabilities. But nowadays, with stronger porcelains, we have the ability still to make things very thin if you have a highly skilled ceramist. But I think a lot of times, we're seeing more reduction and thicker ceramics nowadays. And I don't think that's necessarily needed, but again, every case is different. So again, looking at this, it's not a dogmatic approach where every tooth gets the same amount of reduction. And we're going to go through that more as we move through. So we are trying to create space that we can create a porcelain layer back on the front to alter one's appearance and or color. Now, in prepping the teeth, we obviously need to make sure that we're taking the right amount off. So hence, we want to do depth cuts. And after we've done depth cuts, we're then going to reduce the remainder of the tooth down to those depths. From there, we then go down to the gum line and refine our margins. And then the last thing we do is we want to sight down from the incised ledge to make sure that something can be seated, right? So the line of draw. Now, sometimes that line of draw can kind of wrap around onto the facial, but you have to make sure obviously there's no undercuts. So let's look at preparation design for a moment. Now, these are, you know, straight out of the, uh, the advertisements of some of the, you know, the magazines. These are not mine. What I want you to see here is I don't think, for me personally, I don't think there's a, a, a dogmatic approach like this where you must take off a certain amount. So they're saying in this particular image that, okay, for feldspathic veneers, you've got to take off two tenths to eight tenths. Well, you know, it, it's a nice range, but I, again, I don't think there's one way to do anything because as I've shown in one case, at least the guy wouldn't let me touch his teeth. So we had to see if it was possible to make what he wanted. I had other teeth where I didn't take anything off and we made two tenths of a millimeter of ceramic that we just glued onto the front. So again, every case is different. I don't believe this is the proper approach. Same with incisal edge. I don't think you need to just grind off a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. Now, Ideally, they were saying, you know, hey, feldspathic porcelains had to be a certain thickness for strength. But what we found with time is if you can get it on the tooth and laminate it, being that it's glued on, the veneer derives its strength from the underlying tooth structure. And so it wasn't so much the strength of the material as it was being laminated properly to have strength. So yeah, so I think this is a, the wrong approach. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not that it's bad. I just feel we can do better. And so you may say, okay, well, you know, press ceramics. All right, press ceramics, they say you have to take more off. They say you have to take six tenths to eight tenths. Well, I know some ceramics that can make, you know, press ceramics down to three tenths. So maybe that means I only have to take three tenths of a millimeter off. But if the tooth is set back, maybe I don't have to take anything off and I can put three tenths onto the front of the tooth. So again, hopefully you can see where my mind's at that I'm trying to do the least invasive dentistry to be able to give the patient the best result. So again, I think this is misleading also to say it's a dogmatic approach, All right? So when, when someone was saying earlier, um, materials, what, you know, what material would I use in that hypothetical case? I said, I'm a big fan of feldspathic porcelains and I still am to this day. Anywhere I can put feldspathic, I will. I think they have amazing colors. 
But if I need strength, obviously there's better materials nowadays that have higher strength properties if we're extending porcelain off a tooth. And that's where I start to think when I'm doing my model work of, okay, what type of material am I going to use? How thin can they get it? And how much strength do I need? I'm thinking of all these things while I'm playing with that model, driving where I'm going to go. And, you know, as far as if you need, you know, crazy strength, you might even have to step up into a zirconia, which if you had shown me zirconia veneers 10 years ago, I'd say there's no way I'd put that on someone. Versus nowadays, the color properties in some of the zirconias is amazing. And so it's not no longer uh, something I would not consider. I definitely consider it for the right person. All right. Uh, someone brought up a question on finish lines, and uh, we're going to go into that right now. So if I'm saying I don't have a dogmatic approach, it's really it's custom and unique for each person, the same as if it was my daughter or wife or anyone else. I'm going to make sure I do the best possible job, take the least amount of tooth structure away for longevity. So not that there's anything wrong with these veneer burrs from like Brassler or Comet or anyone else out there. I'm not a fan of them, but if you use them, that's fine. And so again, this would have a dogmatic approach saying, all right, well, if you're trying to take minimal amount of tooth structure off, what they define as minimal is seven tenths uh, in the enamel or the incisal one third, half a millimeter in the middle one third of a tooth and three tenths of a millimeter at the gum line. And they're saying, we're gonna get like a, a zero to one shade changes. I'm assuming by a shade tab that this is the burr I would use. And I would say like, no, that's not what I would use. That's assuming the tooth's in a perfect upright position and is not rotated. But even then, I don't think my technician needs seven tenths of a millimeter to change the appearance with ceramic. And so again, I think this dogmatic approach means you take a lot more tooth structure off. If you go down to the far right side and see extensive where it's saying two to three shade changes, you know, we're taking a lot of tooth structure away there. Now, at least they've gone in and made like a bullet shape for the gum line. Because at the gum line, we're typically going to have a chamfer for most of our cases. Every once in a while, I'll do a, a fine bevel. But for the most part, it's 99% of the time, it's a chamfer, a very thin chamfer. Unless I've got a you know, badly rotated tooth or extensive amount of color change where I have to take more tooth structure away. Now, the other burr I have up there is one of the original depth cutting burrs that I still see people using. And that's great if someone likes using them. But again, I don't think it's a dogmatic approach where I'm using the same amount of reduction on every third of that tooth from the gingival to middle to incisal thirds. And that you have to rock this burr from, you know, incisal to gingival to create the depths you want. So again, what I have found with time is I need a better tool. So what could be better? Well, here's one. This depth reduction burr is safe sided, meaning that I can't go any deeper than what the burr allows me to get. And so it comes with these different sizes from two tenths to seven tenths of a millimeter reduction, and then it jumps to one millimeter. And so these are from Lasco. They're out of the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys, California. And these little depth cutters are what I use for virtually every one of my cases. And so if I've already practiced on my stone model, I know how much reduction I need and where I need it, and now I can be extremely precise. And so if I'm this precise at tenths of a millimeter, I need to show the technician what I'm doing, or I need to give them the model that I prepared. Because if they do it, they may just take a millimeter, millimeter, a quarter off. And I hate to say that, but you know, they may just take a lot off where I'm not planning on it. And now we're in two totally different ballparks as far as where we're going with the case. All right. Okay. So let's look at an example of a case. So this is a simplistic case where we're doing a minor color modification where they have these white hypocalcifications. We're gonna do a slight length change. We're gonna make a slight rotation on the canines. And we're gonna, you know, for the most part, try and stay enamel. Like any case, I'm trying to stay in enamel wherever possible, okay? Functionally, the person just got out of braces. The gum lines are lined up fairly well, uh, but she doesn't have good function as far as the anterior coupling of the laterals and the canines, okay? So she has a bit of an open bite on those. So I actually have space already created. I don't need to take more tooth structure away. It's already gone simply because of where they put the teeth. And so you can see here, these spaces that where you can see her tongue, that was one of her biggest concerns. The second big concern was, Hey, I don't like the white you know, marks on my front teeth. And so these hypocalcifications, we're not sure how deep they go. It's an assumption that it's, you know, it's limited to, you know, the outer enamel, but it could go all the way down to the dentin. So to some extent, 
I may have to do more reduction and I won't know that until I get in there. But the final placement of the veneer in the wax up still is in the same spot, regardless of how deep that white mark goes. So in other words, I can do the wax up and say, hey, in a perfect world, I want to take like half a millimeter off, put a half millimeter back on. And if it turns out I need more color change or more masking, I can always go deeper in my prep, but the wax up still stays in the same spot as far as the final appearance. So as I said before, we take the photographs, we take our models, we take our face bow, we mount the case up and we start to make assumptions, you know, as far as where we're going to put the length of these teeth, how we want it to appear. And what we recognize is the mesial of the canines are deficient. They're kind of rotated in a little bit. We want them to be more prominent on the mesials. We want the lateral number seven to be longer. Obviously, we're going to go ahead and lengthen eight, nine, and 10 as well. But number seven is the one that's going to be lengthened the most. And so when we do the wax up, we can see it here. This becomes a discussion with the patient as far as do we like what this looks like, or is there anything we need to modify? And if they say it looks good, that's great because then we can take this as an architectural blueprint to the mouth and create something very similar in the provisionals as well as in reduction guides. So reduction guides, there's many types. And so this is nothing more than a bleach tray with some holes cut into it. So it's soft and pliable. So based on how you put pressure on it, you may have more space or a lack of space based on how you're applying this. So you gotta be careful if you're using something like this. You can also make something more like an Estex appliance that's rigid, you know, kind of a liner type system. You can put as many holes as you want to measure everywhere possible. Remember what you're measuring is not the outside of the plastic, it's the inside of the plastic. So based on how thick that plastic is, you have to recognize that's part of uh, the measurement you're taking. So be careful what part you're measuring from. But I use both of these on a regular basis. Now I've seen other people that use, you know, polyvinyl uh, type of reduction guides, and I have tried these. I personally am not a big fan of them, but you can use these too, you know, to each his own. I've seen these split thickness guides where you can kind of pull them back. Uh, what I find is as you pull these back, they don't really have a good functional stop. So it's hard to know exactly where they are. And so that's why I personally like the clear aligners that I can put a hole in or a bleach tray I can put a hole through very quickly and easily. All right, so in this case, we were talking about A, B, and C approaches. If we looked at it from the side, we could see it here. And so having already practiced on the model before we go to the mouth, we've already made assumptions on what we're gonna be doing. So it should be no surprise when we get here that we're not questioning and, and trying to make a determination of where we go. We already know what we're doing. Okay, so it becomes a lot easier. It's faster. So as I mentioned, we do the depth cuts. You'll notice I've done the depth cuts on the laterals and the centrals using that Lasco depth cutting burr. It has that safe barrel, so I can't go any deeper. You'll notice it leaves some little black scuff marks as the carbide starts to rub on the enamel. It's not hurting anything. It's just showing me I bottomed out and can't go any further. Now from there, I'm going to go ahead and grab a chamfer burr. You can decide what size you want or how thick it is. But I'm gonna take a chamfer burr and start to connect these three planes. Now you can put as many reduction depth cuts as you'd like. Uh, I typically do three, sometimes four. And so in connecting these planes together, as I said, use your favorite chamfer burr, whatever that is, whether you're like a medium, a coarse. Uh, the last thing I typically do is I usually use a fine one on my margin just to make it nice and smooth for the ceramist but I'm gonna do a fairly thin chamfer at the gum line for many of my veneers to allow either the existing color to come through and be the least invasive, or if we're trying to do a more extensive color change or mask something, then I'm gonna to have to do a deeper chamfer. So again, 99% of the time it's a chamfer. Now, there are rare occasions where I do a kind of a knife edge or flame or bevel, however you wanna define or call it. And that's in someone that maybe the tooth is leaned lingually and I'm trying to make the tooth look like it's more facial and upright. And so I'm just telling the ceramist, hey, you can see where I made the scuff line. That's where it's gonna come straight out, kind of out of the tooth. And so you'll have bulk of material where it comes out of the tooth versus if the tooth was more upright and you do a, a small like you know, bevel or knife edge, now you gotta have this funny kind of protrudence off the tooth before it turns and starts going up the facial plane. And so that's why we typically use a chamfer burr instead uh, to get something that looks more anatomic and realistic. So really it depends on color and positioning as far as how much I take away, but the majority of time it's a chamfer burr. All right, so if we've done this, the next thing becomes, all right, if they show the gum line, 
in their smile. If you want to put that margin under the gum line to change the color so that it doesn't look like you know, the veneer stops and the tooth keeps going, you can pack a small retraction cord to hold the gums out of the way. And by doing so, it moves the gums up half a millimeter or so, such that you can refine your margin right at the gum line. And when you take the uh, retraction cord out, your margin will be slightly under the gum line from having done so. Do you need to place your margin under the gum line? No. It depends on what color you're trying to achieve. It depends on if they show it or not. Obviously, if they have a low lip line, there's no reason to go creating more work for you and taking more tooth structure away. But if they want a white appearance tooth, you might have to go up under the gum line to create that appearance, as opposed to someone who wants a natural appearance where you could have some thin ceramic that allows the natural color to blend through, then you don't have to go under the gum line. Now, if someone goes like, well, hey, what burrs do you use? If you go to Brassler, I've got my own burr kits. I get nothing from them. They just make them for me for my classes. But these are basically the burr kits I use. And so if you look at the one on the left, that's my prep kit. And so I have literally six different thicknesses and or grits of chamfer burrs based on where I'm trying to work, whether it's interproximal, whether it's an upper tooth, a lower tooth, whether I'm trying to take a lot of tooth structure off or a little bit of tooth structure off. Okay. And the same thing with my finishing kit in blue, I have different grits of diamond as well as different carbide flutings to take off either resin or modify ceramic. So if I prepared this case, We've got a couple of different preparation designs. We've got uh, a B approach on eight, nine, and 10. We've got a C approach on number seven where we had length in it more. And as I mentioned on six and 11, we didn't touch them at all. And so I'm taking photographs so the technician can see what we've done. We're obviously taking our impressions. If you're someone who has a scanner, you can you know, go ahead and scan the, the preparations, whatever you'd like to do. And then we have to make provisionals. And with provisionals, the whole goal of a provisional is to keep the teeth from being sensitive and to give the patient the ability to see a new appearance and to talk about color. In my mind, those are the main things we're trying to accomplish. Now, since every case doesn't have a minimum amount of tooth to be taken off, every case is going to be different and the final appearance is going to be different on everyone. Not that the, the color is necessarily exactly what we do in ceramic but it allows them to see if we should go whiter or if the color is close enough. So it really is giving us kind of the base color or the, the foundational color. So in looking at this patient, we maintained no preparation on the canines, but we did make porcelain veneers that went on just the mesial of the canines. You saw the preparation design that we did on seven through 10 that was minimal to change the length and change the color. Now, the color we blended in with the existing teeth to match the same color they have in their mouth. You'll notice she doesn't really show the gum line much, but depending on how she moves when talking and whatnot, we decided to put it under just a hair. Hence, we used a very small retraction cord, and it's probably just barely under the gum line. And so if we look at it here, you can see we have a nice color transition at the gum line that should she ever have gum recession, it will still blend in nicely. And when she goes into protrusive, these are Feld's pathic. She has good functional stop. And when she goes into her excursives, the same thing. We have good stops on the canines. And this is solely out of Feld's pathic porcelain that has laminated the tooth. And this type of procedure has been around for, you know, about 40 years, and it can work quite well in the right individual. If someone was a heavy grinder, this is not the material I would choose. But I think as far as the color, I think color is amazing when you use feldspathic porcelains when you have the right opportunity. At the end of the day, it's based on the patient and what they want. When they look at photos and say, oh, I like that type of tooth or this type of tooth. Based on that, I can derive what I'm creating for them. Okay? So everyone's got a chief complaint, you know, determining what that is through communication and looking at their occlusion, utilizing your photographs and the models. And potentially, if you're like this case where we're not changing the color, we're trying to mimic their existing color. We obviously want to whiten to get the teeth as white as possible that we're trying to mimic. And from there, we did a wax up, which derived how much tooth structure we're taking off and gave us preparation design that we're able to quantify and allowed us also to make a provisional from that. And in doing so, we had already chosen material before we ever started the case. There was no question because of how we already had determined everything that needed to be accomplished. The only thing we didn't know 
was how deep that white kind of opacity was in our tooth. But that didn't play a role in what we were doing with our materials other than the material's thickness because we were maintaining her existing occlusion and we weren't doing a lot of length changes. Okay? So with all that practice we did ahead of time and all the photographs and whatnot, we were able to find where we were going before ever doing anything since we had great communication. And that's pretty much what I want to highlight out of these. Now, we're going to go deeper on the, many of the different topics here, but I wanted to get kind of an overview of kind of the thought process, how we approach these, because they will get more complex, obviously. Now, provisionals is something that I get a lot of questions on. And there's a lot of different ways that I've seen people do provisionals over the years. And so one of the techniques that I personally had kind of come up with that wor has worked well for me for many years is what I'm going to share. But I will touch base on some other different approaches. So let's look at that. Whatever temporary acrylic you have can do the job. Now I'll say there's some I think that are less grainy that have a smoother texture. I think there's others that have prettier colors. There's some that have better strengths, but they can all do the same thing, which is cover a tooth using the technique I'm going to share. Now, as far as length changes, if you have someone that has a lot of length requirements and does a lot of grinding, you might want to use a product that has really good strength properties, right? But they all work, but you might find more fractures, let's say, on someone who's a heavy grinder if you're not protecting it. Now, you could say, well, I don't want to have numerous temporary materials in my office, and that's fine. What you could also do is you could make them a night guard to cover the provisionals while they're waiting for the finals. So that's another way that you could protect things at night if you're not wanting to have multiple different provisional materials in your office. A uh, question came up. How does the lab technician finish the interproximal margins if we don't go through the interproximal contacts? Well, again, if you have a finish line, they have a place to stop. And so what they'll do is they'll usually take um, a scalpel or a knife of some sort, or sometimes a, a interproximal saw type of system, or other times they'll take a very thin disc on a handpiece and they will cut through the existing model, leaving the margins intact of your interproximal area. Uh, so yeah, very easy for them to do that. Um, I don't think personally you need to be breaking contacts again, unless you're trying to change the rotation of a tooth or close a diastema or fix a black triangle. All right, moving on here. So here's another example. Now this patient, we had to go through braces first. And the reason for that was to change the, the root position to maintain as much root as possible because she'd already worn her teeth down. And had we taken gum and bone away, she'd have less crown to root ratio, which makes it less desirable long-term. So fortunately, this patient was, was accepting of moving the four uh, incisors gingivally or apically. So having done so, they're going to get crowns, but she's still getting veneers on the adjacent teeth. And the great thing is this concept works for veneers and crowns and bridges and implants, which I'll show you some examples of that as well. Now, there is a handout for this class. Stay tuned to the end. I'll tell you how to get it. Um, but you'll notice there's a kind of a green turquoise hyperlink down there. And it's a link to the article I wrote on this technique. And so if you want to go and read the whole approach, it's there. But I'm going to show you the approach now. A question came up, do I make the provisionals chair side or do I have the lab make them? I personally make every one of my temporaries. Okay, It's me. It's not the assistant. And I make them chair side. Um, another question comes in and says, if we don't break the context, won't the margin stain over time become unesthetic? No. The reason something stains and becomes unesthetic is because you didn't have a, a very accurate margin or you didn't have the air inhibition layer removed from your resin or you had a defect. In other words, a slight indentation where the resin wasn't all the way out to the margin. Other than that, you shouldn't have any type of color change there. So usually it's more of a technique problem versus just putting a margin there. Okay, so here we can see the same patient. And so like anything, we do a wax up. That wax up is then duplicated into a stone model. And so here we can see a stone model for this patient. 
Now, this bead line technique that I call uh, the procedure that I came up with is you're going to want to take some type of sharp instrument. Now, I typically use a discoid cleoid for a lot of it, but sometimes I'll use a gold foil knife. Other times I'll actually implement a barred Parker as well. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to scribe a half millimeter to one millimeter groove, excuse me, into the tissue and the tooth structure where we're planning on putting our margin. And so that margin, if it's at the gum line, we're scribing this little trough, this little defect into this stone model. And interproximally, we're not trying to open the contacts here. We're not trying to take the interproximal contacts away. We are just scribing along the gum line with this instrument. Now, if you have a tiny little positive, little bleb, that's you know kind of right between the teeth, that's when I'll take a scalpel and take the little bleb away. But we're not trying to break contacts here. Okay. Now, having scribed these lines, you can see here at the gum line, in this case, it's going to be a crown, right? We're going to scribe it back into the uh, papilla area just a little bit. We're going to take maybe a barred Parker if necessary, only if necessary, to clean out any little positives that are interproximal, but we're not trying to open this up. We're not trying to make it any deeper. These little lines we're scribing create positives in an impression. The positives are what I call that bead line. And so based on obviously practice, you can get really good at creating a nice little papilla area, as well as this nice little trough around every margin for the crowns on both the facial and lingual and the veneers only on the facial, okay? So these little bead lines, basically since they're positives, when you put it into the patient's mouth, it's actually gonna put pressure right on your marginal area. And by doing so, it cleaves the provisional acrylic, allowing you to have less or no cleanup, which makes life quick and easy, but also means that you're not damaging people's tissues, you're not damaging margins on things that you couldn't see because they were covered with acrylic. And then the one other thing I'll point out here is you'll notice uh, right between eight and nine, I put a little like um, defect on the facial. I think there's a pointer here. Let me point to it. Um, there's a pointer. So right here, you'll see that little defect. I make a little scribe there to orientate it when I'm putting it in the mouth. So I know where to go between eight and nine. The other thing I do is I take a scalpel and I just cut a bunch of excess off to make this flat area. It's kind of like a table. And so all the excess that extrudes out pretty much just sits on this table as one big piece. And usually when it gets done hardening, I can pull it off in one or two big pieces. And because of the bead line I've scribed in there, usually because of the pressure, whatever little tiny thin amount that could have been here comes off with that big piece. Now, someone asked, could I ask the laboratory to do this on the wax up to make me the stent? Sure you can. You can show them the same thing and let them do it, right? Definitely can delegate that to them. Now, there's other times where you've seen the lab use the big Siltec putties. I'm not a fan of the Siltec putties because they usually are fairly thick. It's like getting a hockey puck into someone's mouth, which most patients are not a huge fan of. And so that's where I started using these little trays. They're just little interior trays. I get these from Denmat, uh, but Clinician's Choice has some little metal ones as well, as well. But I like these little ones. Usually it'll cover the front 10 teeth easily. Uh, and I can use them interchangeably with maxillary mandibular cases. But um, this becomes very thin, obviously, and using a fast setting uh, polyvinyl material. In this case, I've got um, template from Clinician's Choice. So let's look at this case further. Here's the patient. If we do our ideal preparations, as I said, because she has an open bite now, because she had shortened her teeth and we pushed them up apically, she was getting four crowns because of it. So we've got crowns on the front four, and then we've got some minimal prep veneers on the side. And the reason I'm showing this to you again is just to highlight the beadline uh, provisional technique. We're not really going into prep design at this point, but the teeth are going to be totally dry. We're not etching. We're not bonding. They're just dry teeth that we've loaded this beadline over impression with acrylic, and we're pushing it over the teeth. We then wait for it to harden. Typically, I have a little bit on the counter to feel, but I also set a timer. If they say it takes three minutes to harden, I'm usually going to wait a little bit longer, maybe another 30 seconds or a minute, and then I'm going to carefully pull it out. 
Having done so, usually I can get a pretty phenomenal look right out of the box. Every once in a while, I might have a little bubble somewhere in the acrylic that I got to fill in with a little bit of flowable. Again, I don't have to etch. I don't have to bond. There's obviously open receptor sites in the resin chemistry that allow me just to bond straight to it. Okay. There's a little bit of an air inhibition layer also that I can adhere to. I personally will just take either a, a wet two by two gauze and wipe off the teeth just so they, you know, the little bit of slime layer that might be there is gone. If you want to take a little polishing cup or, you know, uh, like a, a Jiffy polisher from Alternate, if you want to polish these a little bit, you can. I don't try to polish them too much. I want it to have a slight texture to it. I want them to not be ideal, but they look pretty darn good. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients come back and tell me that their friends thought they had their final veneers already when all along it was just provisionals. Okay. Uh, someone asked the question, are you able to floss with these provisionals? Well, as you can tell, this was one big piece of acrylic that went in. And so on the crowns, those are obviously all connected together, kind of like a bridge, they're splinted. But also if this were a veneer case, all my veneers are splinted together also. So part of the strength is derived by everything going in at once. And the acrylic, when it's runny, is going into little areas, maybe interproximally or at the gum line, or it's shrink wrapping around the lingual. And so all of that helps this gain its strength to hold on while you're waiting for the finals to be created. Now, someone says, okay, well, if you can't floss, you know, what's my oral hygiene recommendations? Well, I tell them to brush and clean better than they've ever done before. Obviously, if they got a water pick, that's great. If they don't, they can obviously do oral rinses. But yeah, just routine cleaning with a good toothbrush on a regular basis is all I tell them to do. And that works out fine. Uh, the next question that's in here is, is, do I ever have to trim the margins? Of course I do. I can tell you on this one here, this was like one of three incredible ones that I had where we just laughed and looked at this and said, you got to be kidding me. You know, everyone gets lucky some days, but yeah, there's usually some little bit of excess I've got to trim somewhere. And if I do, I typically am going to grab either a 12 fluted or 24 fluted carbide burr, whether it's a flame shape or a, a, a you know, Christmas tree shape, whatever you want to call it, based on the, the place you're trying to get into, or maybe it's on the lingual aspect and you want to use a football shape. I leave that up to you, but we're using a carbide to trim off the excess. Obviously, the more flutes you have, the less you'll remove or the longer it will take. So you get more of a polishing effect. It's a little safer, right? Uh, but that's basically what I'm using. Yeah, the shrink wrap technique has been around a long time. And depending on how you do it, you may have a lot of excess. Or in this case, the whole reason I, I created this was I didn't want to clean off a bunch of excess. You know? and, and so after many years of cleaning excess, I said, there's got to be a better way. And that's when I derive putting that little bead line on the model to create a positive that cleaves it for me so I don't have to clean up excess. It's very rare I've got to clean much up. But if I have, let's say, let's, let's say this, if I, if I put this in and where I made the depression, the bead line on a model, and that bead line in the case of the patient's mouth is in the wrong place. Let's, let's say I, I move the margin up gingerly, but the point that it pressed let's say is above where my margin is. And so now I've got exposed enamel or dentin because my margin was short. Well, it's real easy. I just grab a flowable. Again, I don't have to etch. I don't have to bond. I just run the flowable into the area that's, that's absent. And then I run a little bit of the flowable up onto the existing you know, provisional material. And they will, again, chemically bond together. And that's enough to allow it to stay so that it looks good and covers the tooth enough so they're not sensitive. Okay. So very simple, easy approach. Uh, let's see. Question become, uh, so this shrink wrap technique, what happens if when I pull off the over impression and the whole temporary comes out in my hand, right? I've had that happen. I've done one of two things based on the preparation design. Either I didn't leave it in long enough and I want it to grab on more so, or I had some bubbles in places, or I may go back and floss all the contacts, maybe to create a little bit of space at the gum line or allow a little bit of material to go in between the teeth. I may try the whole thing over again. I personally don't want to have to cement things on. Um, so I, I usually I will do it over again. Uh, if I had to cement it back on, I'll show you that in just a moment. So that leads to another good question. All right, let me get these questions out of my way here. 
Uh, can I briefly go over the bead line technique again? Yes. So basically we have a wax up. That wax up is turned into a stone model. The stone model, I scribe a half a millimeter to a millimeter in depth margin, you know, a defect into everywhere my margin is going to be. So if it's a veneer, it's along just the facial at the gum line. If it's a crown, it's on the facial and lingual at the gum line. Okay. So that's where the bead line goes. Now that gum line goes a little bit up in between the teeth. So I got to scribe just a little bit in that papilla area. So I get that tiny little point in that over impression. Now I don't want to scribe a line in approximately, right? Because that's going to make the acrylic weak and potentially break them. Okay. So then you almost have individual ones. You don't want that. But I will take a scalpel if there's any little positives. I will clean out some little positives so it looks pretty. Could I also have left the positives and then just take them out with a burr once I'm putting the acrylic in the patient's mouth? I can that way also. It just takes a little extra time. So I'm trying to minimize the amount of time. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of different types of uh, uh, oral rinses and things that you can rub on the gum tissues to help or give patients bottles of things. We've done that in the past. I stopped doing it many years ago, but you know, there's plenty of oral medication uh, liquids that you can give them as well as Q-tips to rub it on, et cetera, if someone had pointed out. Okay, so looking at the same case from the lingual, so ideally not having to reduce any excess, you can see that the gum lines here on the lingual are very nicely done because of how we did the bead line. Uh, now on the veneers, on the canines and the premolars, the bead line is not on the lingual, but I have tried it on the lingual, just you know, kind of in the middle of the tooth or the incisal edge of the tooth to cleave off excess on the lingual. And that can work uh, if you want to, but I don't normally do that. But someone's asked that past as well. Uh, another question, do I use any type of disinfectant or cleaning the preps prior to seating the impression? Uh, so if you want, you can use like some benzoclonium chloride or something. Uh, yeah, you can certainly use different types of disinfectants. Uh, I personally don't do any, uh, but a long time ago I did. I found over time that was unnecessary. Uh, but there's no harm in doing that if you want to clean the tooth structure beforehand. Okay. So here's the patient with her provisionals. So now it gives us the ability to talk about color. So when she looks at herself, well, color and shape. Uh, so if we want to make modif modifications to the shape, we can do so now simply by grinding something away or taking whatever flow we want to add. Again, just adding some flow on, it'll adhere to the existing material. It also gives us the ability to say, okay, the base color we have here, let's say it's a, a bleach shade of acrylic. You know, is this about the color you want to be? Or are you thinking you want to be slightly whiter? Or are you thinking like, no, no, this is too white. I want it slightly warmer. It gives us the ability to actually quantify something and see it on their person to give us a little more information that we can tell the laboratory where we want to go. Okay. Now, granted, it's one color of acrylic, uh, but it just, again, it's that base color. We can certainly look at photographs for incisal edge translucency. We can look at Instagram. You know, we can kind of go all over the place to find different colors for modification and textures and crazy incisal edges. So again, provisionals. We'll do one more case here. With a provisional, so again, you'll get the beeline technique here. Um, we have a case that comes in. We take impressions. We practice in the laboratory during our preparation design. We figure out the limitations of where things maybe need to go out more facially or need to be pulled back. Based on that, we determine our preparation so that we come to the mouth, we can figure out where we're going. Now, just by looking at this case, you can tell the canines are rotated and we've got diastemas. So we know on a rotation case and diastemas, we're going to have to extend interproximal. Okay? We also know that potentially where the canines are flared out distally, we're going to have to take some tooth structure off there more so than other places. We have a deficiency on the mesial, but we have an excess on the distal. So all of our preparation design on the models is going to help us in practicing how we're going to address this case. Ideally, since she has kind of small teeth, we might be able to build things out more facially as well as longer. So it means we're going to stand enamel and take less tooth structure off. So again, I see this case really quickly as being very minimally invasive by looking at it. And that just comes with time. So again, same photos we talked about before, different case, but they apply. Uh, you do your models, you do your wax up, you do your beadline technique, you take your over impression to create that. 
And then from here, again, you can use this as a provisional, which we just talked about, but you can also use it in some cases where you're trying to build things out facially. You can use this as a diagnostic tool where it's a, a mock-up like I showed on that patient earlier. So again, there's no etching, there's no bonding, it's mechanical retention only, but it gives us the ability to mock up the case to show the patient where we're going, but also to show us how much tooth structure we need to take off. Uh, let's see, someone asked earlier if it's more challenging for the patient to clean the margins if we don't break the contact. No, it's not any more challenging. Uh, their toothbrush goes in there the same as any other time. So uh, very simple. Now, if someone wants to neglect their hygiene, you can always create irritation and problems. But again, if they're doing a good job of cleaning things, it's not an issue. Uh, someone also asked, uh, they were taught that veneers are contraindicated for Bruxers. Uh, is this outdated teaching? You know, everyone's entitled to their opinions. Uh, I've got plenty of people that are, I, 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 there's a ton of people out there, not just in my office, but everywhere that were grinding their teeth down that have gotten veneers. So no, I don't think it's contraindicated. But it's for the same token, the tooth's the strongest thing in your body. If you ruined it, you're probably going to ruin the porcelain too if you don't change something. Well, changing something means you better start wearing a guard to protect your teeth at night or treat the bruxism. Uh, so no, I have no problem treating brux bruxism with uh, veneers. Uh, we're going to talk about how to remove the provisionals in a moment. So I'll pass on that question. Uh, do I, oh, good question. Do I charge patients for wax ups and consults? Uh, I don't charge for my consults because I don't want to limit someone to not come in and see me. I want to be able to give them information that hopefully if they don't go with me, they at least have great information to go make a better decision. As far as the wax up, yes, I charge for the wax up. Because um, if they don't move forward, I don't want to have lost out on that money, right? But I do have an agreement with my laboratory that they do the wax ups for me. And if the case moves forward, they credit me back my wax up. Uh, let's see, someone else asks for an eight unit veneers, how many hours uh, do I allow between model preparation, teeth preparation and delivery? Uh, good question. Every one of them is going to be different. Patients usually in the chair for three hours. It's usually, I don't know, 15 minutes in the lab of practice preps. Uh, delivery for me is usually probably another two to three hours. So uh, a little over five hours on an eight unit case. Uh, we're getting to impressions next. I'm just kind of hitting on a, a couple of things here. All right. So for this case that I'm talking about, since she has a lot of deficiencies, this is gonna be a slight preparation case, but I wanna minimize the amount of tooth reduction and I wanna see if we build things out facially, how much we can get away with. And so for this case, you can see here that I haven't touched the teeth, I've just put acrylic over them based on my bead line provisional. And you'll see here, you know, someone's asking earlier, is there ever excess? Yeah, I just kind of quickly threw this in there and so maybe I didn't push hard enough but nonetheless, you can see there's a little excess in a couple of places. Very minimal, obviously, but yeah, I would have to clean that up if I were keeping this on, but I'm not trying to make this perfect at this point. What this is doing is it's showing me and showing the patient like, hey, if I make your tooth about half a millimeter thicker, are you gonna be okay with that appearance? And so this is, you know, she's not numb at this point. She's just sitting in the chair and I'm just filling up the beadline over impression and putting it on her teeth. And you can see here, this is the final appearance. And she's like, yeah, I love it. And so for me, it's showing me that, okay, the acrylic really didn't stay on the distals of the canines because it was too thin and it just pressed it out of the way. So the distal, the canines is going to have to be reduced, but everywhere else I've got potentially enough thickness that I'm taking minimal to no two structure away. And so you'll see here that this becomes not only a tool to talk to the patient, but it's a tool showing me that I can take less two structure away. So the last code depth cutting burrs. I'm now doing depth cuts into the acrylic. And by doing so, you can see the black scuff marks I talked about earlier. You can see them up here. So I can't go any deeper. So I may go, hey, three tenths at the gum line and maybe five tenths up here. Maybe I'm doing like you know six, seven tenths on the incisal edge. And so in doing this, I'm stopped by the acrylic. Now what I do is I go back with my chamfer burr, and it's the same thing we already talked about. These are all the steps. I go back with my chamfer burr and start to connect these planes together. And what I find when I get over here is I've barely scuffed the enamel and I really haven't changed the incisal edge because what I took off 
didn't even go deep enough to touch the incisal edge. So I don't have to take any more tooth structure away. So it allows me to see that I can give an incredible appearance without taking much of any tooth structure off. Now we'll notice on the distals of the canines where they were sticking out, yeah, I'm gonna have to take some off of there, right? So when I did my depth cuts, I'm going in and actually touching tooth there, but on the mesial, it's still a bunch of thick acrylic. So I don't have to take anything away there other than put a finish line for my laboratory technician. Uh, let's see. Uh, I use two different laboratories. I use one lab, in, well, they're both in Irvine. Uh, one is known as VTech, V is in victory. Uh, the other is known as Ultimate Styles. All right, so here you can see her case uh, on the right-hand side where it was prepared. Uh, you can see me taking some photographs for the technician so they have an idea of what the underlying color is. And you can see I've got some uh, very thin retraction cord to push the tissue up a little bit so I can put a nice chamfer finish line there at the gum line. And so not only did I use that bead line technique to show me how little amount of tooth structure I can remove, but it also showed the patient what's possible. But then I'm going to use it again after taking my impression, obviously, to put a provisional back on. Okay, so let me back up for a second because someone asked about impression. So obviously at this point where I've done my reduction, I take an impression just like you would on any crown uh, inlay or onlay. And then after I've captured my impression, then I put my temporary on. So again, very easy to put this temporary on, very minimal cleanup. The patient looks amazing. They get to walk around and enjoy this while they're waiting for the final product. But again, color-wise, she said, well, hey, I want to go whiter. You know, I, this, is, this is nice, but I want to go whiter. And I said, okay, no problem. We can do that. So again, it gives us the ability to have a discussion, not only on the appearance of shape, but also on um, uh, color. Uh, someone asks, uh, if it's a no prep case or, or minimal to no prep, I guess, uh, how thick is my finish line? Uh, my finish line is just enough on a case that I really don't have to reduce anything just to show the lab where I'm stopping. So it's giving them kind of a benchmark to go into. So I don't really have like an ideal depth. It's maybe a 10th. Uh, so it's really just showing them where to go. Uh, if the depth cut doesn't go through the plastic, do you remove the remaining temporary material? Yeah, pretty much it just comes off. And so that's the beauty of it. You go, wow, I didn't even have to touch the tooth over there. Now, so let's say for an example, she knocks one of these off. Let's say she's eating. And even though she's not supposed to be eating on the provisionals, let's say she knocks the corner off. And so I've got to put the whole temporary back on one tooth. Okay, if it's one tooth, this is my go-to product. This clear temp LC, all I do is bring the patient in. I don't have to numb them up. I dry the tooth. I dry off the provisional. I flow a little bit of this on the inside of the temporary, squish it down on the tooth wipe off the excess, hit it with a curing light, and it is solid. It's really good stuff. Does that mean they can't knock it off again? Sure they can, but it's phenomenal how good this stuff adheres. If they knocked off, let's say four or five out of the six, you know, I may say, you know what? I can make that whole provisional over again in three minutes. Uh, I might just knock the rest of them off and do the whole thing over again based on how much damage we have, or maybe if they, when the three fell off, she bit down into them and broke the other three. Uh, you know, so it really kind of depends. So I can go either way. So based on whatever scenario you have, uh, these are the two approaches that I would give you. Here you can see the final restorations. So she went a little bit whiter, as we said. What I want you to see is from the wax up to the provisionals to the finals, we maintain the shape. So when I show someone a wax up or provisionals, I tell them we can match about 90% of what you see. If you need to make some kind of global changes, we can do that. But as far as some tiny little detail, those don't really matter because when someone's building these by hand, tiny little things don't come into account. It's really just global big changes. But you can see here, the ceramics is pretty good about maintaining that wax up into the provisionals and into the finals. Okay. Uh, that's it. Someone asked if a 10th of a millimeter finish line is going to result in an overhanging margin. No, there, a margin is not going to overhang or go longer unless your lab extends beyond a margin. What it's going to do is you're going to have a little more of a prominent starting to move out facially. So again, depending on how thin you make your porcelain, depending on the angulation of the tooth is going to determine uh, what you're doing at that gum line. So based on its angulation, labial or lingual, depending on your technician's ability to make thickness of a veneer extremely thin, there's a lot of variables there.
You can always go deeper if you'd like. Okay. Uh, so the question on impressions, we're gonna hit on that real quick and then we'll get to cementation. Couple quick things I threw out for you. These are the only trays I use for taking my impressions. These are from Clinician's Choice, they're known as Heat Wave. Why do I use these? Because in one minute in a hot water bath, 158 degrees, these are pliable. So I can make these fit someone custom instantly. By using something that has a custom fit, we use less material, which saves you money, but it also becomes more accurate because the thicker the impression material, the more inaccuracy you have, but it also forces material down around the gum line. Uh, so these, in my mind, are the best impression trays out there for crown and bridge and you know, veneers, implants, et cetera. So they have four uppers and four lowers. It comes with a caliper, as you can see, and a little plastic card. You take the caliper to the model or the patient's mouth and you measure around the premolar area. You take it back to the card and it tells you what size to start with. And so it says, start with a 42. So I grab a 42. Now these trays, they actually did research on, unlike all the other trays we have in dentistry that have no research, they just made trays and said, those will be close enough. Someone did a ton of research measuring people's jaws and came up with these. And you'll notice by looking at this, how well it fits this patient's mouth. This happens the majority of the time. It's not that often I have to go in and customize one of these trays, but the beauty is when I have to, it works quickly and easily, but this is how well they fit. So you can imagine the only place this impression material is gonna go is up into the sulcus and around the teeth, right? Here's my expensive water bath. In one minute's time, this becomes pliable and I can adapt it to my model. So here you can see where the molars on the back of the mouth are hanging up this particular model. And so I can literally stick the uh, tray either in the patient's mouth or with a model and start to extrude and or bend the material and then chill it with either air or cold water which allows me to have a custom fit. So I've gone further in this case and I put my thumb into the roof of the mouth and I've collapsed the whole buccal corridor down such that I get a really good adaptation. So if I'm doing veneers, it's gonna be very thin impression material and it's gonna be forced around the teeth. Kind of hard to see here, but we did you know, some front veneers and a crown over on number uh, five. So anyway, it, it forces material where I want it to go. So it makes my life easy. And, and so this is pretty much what I do with all of my impressions. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. If someone wanted to know what material, I personally like to use Thermoclone from Ultradent. They have numerous different viscosities, different set times. The one thing that I really love about it, obviously, you know, the wettability and it, it's detail orientation, but a lot of impression materials nowadays set up very quickly. And so for me, if I'm doing a lot of bigger cases, I want something that actually is going to take a little longer to set up. Uh, so I like this one because it, you know, at a three minute and 15 second, it's kind of a longer set time where I used to use Impergum, which had a nice long set time. Uh, I've now jumped to this one uh, because it has great you know, detail characteristics, great wettability, but it has that, that length of time for me, the working time. Uh, another doctor asks, what's the minimum thickness required for strength of a veneer? Uh, in my mind, there is no minimum thickness for strength. There's a minimum thickness for handling. For the laboratory technician to handle it, they're probably going to get it no thinner than about two to three tenths of a millimeter. Uh, for you handling it, it depends on what type of uh, cement you're using and how hard you push on it, whether you're going to break it or not. But if glass is supported by tooth and it's laminated properly, strength goes out the window. Now, if you're concerned more about hanging something off an incisal edge, well, now the thicker the feldspathic porcelain, the stronger it is when it's hanging out in space. Uh, same thing with any porcelain. Uh, but if we're, again, if we're going to extend something out into space, I would be more concerned with using a stronger material versus the strength of um, the thickness. So start with something stronger. Ah, good question. So uh, someone asks, if I'm doing a single veneer, do I spot etch and bond? <laughs> it depends. If I've got black triangles at the gum line or I broke the contacts, no, I won't do any of that. Uh, depending on the functional you know, demands, uh, if I'm not lengthening the tooth, oftentimes I won't etch and bond. If I've got, you know, crazy amounts of force on it and a lot of tooth is gone and there's not much retention, then yeah, I'll use some type of temporary cement. Usually that clear temp LC, I typically don't etch and bond anymore. That clear temp is phenomenal. Oh, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> One of my Legion members. Awesome. Good to see you here. Okay. 
Uh, another caveat I throw in, these little tips uh, you can buy from Clinician's Choice and there's a throwaway magazine called Practicon. I shouldn't say magazine, but it's their, uh, it's all the products they sell. They sell these two little tips. I couldn't say enough great things about these two little tips because you can bend the metal. So if you're working down in the lower interiors and you don't have enough space for the typical white or yellow plastic tips that come from the manufacturers, these work great. Right, So I can literally put this tip right into the sulcus or right on top of the sulcus or literally lay it right on the, the margin and inject it makes life easy. So I throw these two in there just to, to show you that. Okay, moving on. We're still kind of talking about provisionals and gum tissue for a moment. Obviously, this is not a veneer case, but I wanted to show you because usually someone asks like, okay, we're talking about taking impressions and moving gums. We've all taken impressions, right? You've got you know different types of cords out there. I personally don't use cords that often, but you'll see it in a number of these cases here. If I am going to use a cord, it's usually a small thin cord, either a double zero, triple zero. I don't want to try and damage the gum tissue. I don't want to cause bleeding. I'm just trying to push the gum up just a little bit out of the way so I can place a margin or capture the margin in an impression. So sometimes I leave those cords in. When you pull the cords, oftentimes when you find bleeding. If I do find bleeding, I typically am going to use the Ultradent Viscostat Clear. Now, this is a big tip. If you use the traditional Viscostat, it's an iron-based product, as many astringents are. They will oxidize. The margins will turn black. And so people think that's bacterial leakage. It's not. It's because the iron oxidized and turned black. In the case of the Viscostat Clear, it was purposely made for interior cosmetics. It's made from aluminum chloride. It does not have the ability to turn color because it's not iron-based. Uh, uh, someone brings up a question. Do I adapt and form the thermoplastic trays on a model or in the mouth? I do both. Depends on the patient. Uh, if I have a model, I typically do it on the model. Uh, if I have someone with a big tori and I don't have a model, I'll do it right in their mouth. Um, if you do it on a wax up, big takeaway here. If you try to make that thermoplastic on your wax up, you will melt the wax up. So ask me how I know. That's part of dentistry, always practicing, learning something new. All right, uh, this one's interesting because we use the beadline provisional. And so on the veneers, obviously it's the same technique, but where I had the implant, you'll notice I put a piece of Teflon tape over the implant uh, abutment, you'll see it here. So by putting it over the abutment, I created a little space such that we can go under there and floss later on and it's not putting pressure or anything on there. And so the person can go under there and clean. Okay, so you can see it there. Yeah, there's a little excess in this case. You'll notice someone asked earlier. Yeah, sometimes there's some excess you got to clean off. So the patient's now walking around with this appearance while they're waiting for the finals, veneers and crowns. And then obviously we deliver the finals. Uh, so I throw that in just for a deviation because sometimes you have veneers and crowns and things together. Okay. So tissues. I mentioned using cord on occasion, really just in the case of moving tissue out of the way a little bit to place a margin. Sometimes I've got tissue that's a problem. It's bleeding, it's irritated, it's in the way, it doesn't look appealing, whatever it is, you got to have a tool. You got to have a tool that's consistent to remove the problem. So here we have a patient that came into the practice, has a crown that doesn't look ideal, and it's fractured up the center, and the gum line's really bad. So it's kind of like having a, you know, a photo with a broken glass uh, and, a, and a bad frame. We want to change all that. And so to do that, obviously you do your diagnostic wax up, you know, and, and figure everything out as far as a temporary. But in the case of the gum line, you can actually cut on the model of where you want to go. Now, you will need to have already, you know, either numb them up to test how far you're going to go or gently probe and then add on another two to three millimeters where the bone's going to be. So we're making assumptions here as far as biologic width and where we can go. If you can't get it to where you need to go, then they need crown lengthening and either you or the periodontist or whomever needs to perform that procedure. In this case, when we measured, we found that we had enough space that we could go ahead and laser away tissue. So again, having the right tool. Could I have gone in with an electro surge or radio surge or you know, a scalpel? Certainly can. But with those, you're typically gonna have more bleeding and or discomfort and the tissue isn't always stable. You can get some recession. With a laser, depending on how you use it, it can be very precise, take away the right amount of tissue. But at the same time, I can trough, so I don't have to pack a cord. I made a little trough or space for my impression material, and I can also stop the bleeding. So this becomes a phenomenal tool for doing impressions, obviously. Uh, so in this case, obviously, it's a crown. 
So we derived our provisional. And in this case, we obviously cemented the provisional because it's a crown. We did not do a shrink wrap technique. But you'll notice here a cutaway on a side, you know, a laser is going in here and vaporizing tissue. And if you have enough space for the connective tissue that you haven't invaded the biologic width, this will stay where you put it. It won't rebound or cause a problem, okay? But if you invade that biologic width, that tissue will get red and angry and inflamed and will go back to where it was, okay? So you can't just take away tissue. All right, uh, so someone asked, what laser do I use? You know, I've been lecturing on lasers for almost 20 years. The one that I personally use right now that I love is the Gemini from Ultradent. It's a dual wave la uh, laser, dual wavelength laser. So it's got 810 and 980. Uh, 810 wavelength and 980 wavelength are different in that they absorb slightly different into melanin, hemoglobin, and water. By having both, you get the benefit of both. So I like this because of that. It's also portable, so I could run it to any room. Uh, it's got a little aiming beam as well as a flashlight on the end, and it has all the presets to make life easy. Uh, so it's phenomenal. That's from, uh, that's from Ultradent. Uh, someone asked, can veneer preps be scanned as well? They certainly can. I've had three scanners given me to evaluate. Uh, you can definitely use a scanner. That's not a problem. All right. So the Gemini is a 20-watt diode laser, phenomenal laser. I don't know why I've got those photos in there twice. All right. Uh, do I charge for gum recontouring? You bet I do. All right. Uh, let's see. We're going into an, a rotational case and then cementation. So obviously we take our photos, we do our models, we practice on the models, we do the wax up. From there, we talked about cases that didn't have much rotation. So let's look at rotation for a minute. Let's look at a case as though we we're going to do you know, orthodontic procedure for someone. So in this hypothetical case, again, from Dr. Crispin's book, you can see the laterals rotated. So it doesn't matter how many teeth are rotated, you treat them all the same one tooth at a time. So you're practicing on your models. The first thing you do is reduce all excessive tooth structure. So if we said hypothetically, everything's lined up nicely, but the lateral, the mesial is sticking out facially, right? And the distal lingual is stuck out into the lingual aspect of their mouth. So the first thing we gotta do is normalize or harmonize things. So you'll notice here, if I take off the extra tooth structure that shouldn't be there, now the tooth looks like it's been rotated and it's in the right position. You look at the side cutaway views, you can see the facial on just the mesial, we've cut some tooth structure away. On the distal, you'll know where it's highlighted as B, you'll say we've taken off, we've done an enamelplasty on the lingual distal area as well. Okay, so the first thing you do is remove excess. From there, once you've done that, now you got to go in and do more reduction of the tooth. You're doing the ideal reduction, which again, based on, you know, what material you're using, what color you're, you know, you're trying to achieve, what the angulation is facial to lingual determines your tooth reduction, okay? But you do your ideal reduction. So if we're saying in a perfect world, let's say it's half a millimeter, then across the facial of all of these teeth, I took off half a millimeter, except, except the facial towards the distal where we already had a deficiency because the tooth was rotated. So I don't really have to take anything off over there, but I am going to put a margin, right? I've got a finish line margin in the proximal area. You can see it. Oops. Um, now you'll notice where we had a deficit on the lingual mesial, which is highlighted by the area known as A. Because there's a deficiency there, you have to wrap over onto the lingual to fill in deficiency for strength because you made the tooth thin. But in this case, as you wrap around, you may have to break that contact. How will you know? Well, you'll know when you do the practice on the model before you go to the patient. But if they have a black triangle or they had a slight you know, opening in your proximal contact, then you're definitely going to extend through and you're going to take that contact away. You'll notice on the side views, you can see A and B, how the A aspect, we've taken a fair amount of tooth structure off the front, right? On the B, you'll notice we've taken some away on the lingual that was excessive. We did an enamel plastic. If it's still an enamel, we don't have to change anything. We just polish it. But we had to put a little bit of a finish line in there at the gum line potentially, right? So based on how your tooth is rotated, you may have to take tooth off certain parts, but not the whole tooth. And that's where, again, I don't believe there's a dogmatic approach. Your diagnostic wax up is basically that three dimensional blueprint that allows you to communicate all of this to the patient, to the technician, 
and to you when you go in to do the work. So you can see here, we've made a tooth look like it's rotated. And you can see in the side views how you can actually make a tooth move in rotation or in its facial lingual positioning based on how you prepare the tooth structure. And so I show you this because it's a lead in to obviously this one case that exemplifies that. And you'll notice here, the patient has worn their teeth down and they have diastemas. So you're gonna practice on your models. And this is me practicing. I'm gonna take some gum tissue away to recontour it. I'm gonna then modify the tooth structure, do my ideal preparations. I'm gonna to have to extend it approximately. So I'm extending back to the lingual. So I'm gonna break contacts back here to the, the, um, the distal lingual line angle and the mesial lingual line angles to create space. I'm then gonna start waxing things up or the lab will wax it up for me. And um, you can use different types of appliances or devices to get ideal you know, proportions. And so after the wax up's done, we've got a lot of notes here as far as maybe having to do a little enamel plasty on lower teeth to get them out of the way to make the case ideal. So there's a lot of communication going on. The wax up then gets duplicated so that we can make our reduction guides and our beadline over impression. So we talked about these already. We can then see our patient here. You can see how much wear and spacing and flaring she has. So we know we're gonna have to do a lot more reduction on this case. Because they're flared, they have to look like they're going back to the lingual more so. So there's gonna be more facial reduction. So we have our reduction guides to show us where we need to end. Again, we've talked about different types there. We also talked about how the gum line had to be modified. So how do I transfer that information from the model to the patient's mouth? I can take a bleach tray or a rigid tray and do a suck down on my model and then scallop that of where the tissue needs to be. Now you can go back in here with a periodontal probe or a, a knife or a laser and start to make marks of where the uh, gingival positioning needs to be. Having done so, you can then pull this off and modify the gum tissues. In this case, we went back in with a laser. I then do my depth cuts. You can see all the scuffs. I then connect those planes together, right? So you can see we have some extensive reduction in places. In this case, I was using cords. I'm not sure why I was doing it that day when I had a laser out, but say uh, lovey, that's what I was doing. Obviously, you'd take your impressions, you'd make your provisionals, that beadline provisional. Um, and then usually the question which hasn't been asked is how do I get my provisionals off? Since they're all shrink wrapped on, especially a big case like this where they wrap around a lot. You want to be careful, obviously. You don't want to damage the teeth. So you want to be very careful not to cut the tooth, but also not to break teeth. So what I'll do is I will cut up the facial and over the incisal and down the lingual, uh, if it's a crown or just up the facial if it's a veneer, trying not to touch the tooth structure. I won't go all the way down to my margin in case somebody moves, I'm not damaging a margin. If I obviously hit a little bit of tooth structure in the middle of the tooth, it's just gonna fill in with resin. I'll then take a crown key and put a little pressure, a little torque uh, and try to find one that's loose that comes out easily. I'm not trying to break and pop these. I'm trying to do it very easily because I have had one in the past. I don't remember if it was root canal treated or a big filling, but broke a piece off because of the leverage I put on it. So be careful. Um, I'm not sure what stone the lab uses. I use um, modern materials, white stone. And um, I forget the name of the wax. Uh, if you write me an email, I can tell you the wax when I get back in the office on Monday. I'm going to ask about stone and wax. All right, so here we can see the patient before and after. Big change for her. We obviously had seen her beforehand in the photograph where we did a digital mock-up. She thought the mock-up was just a little too white for her. You can see the final appearance obviously isn't quite as prominent, but pretty much the same type of appearance. So again, we can carry that forward, like we said before, from provisionals into finals. In this case, as you know, all cases, if you have extensive wear and bruxism like this one did, you need to wear an appliance. And she wore an appliance for the first few years and then decided not wearing it anymore. You can see here 12 years later, the amount of wear that she's had, but she hasn't broken the veneers, fortunately. That's anecdotal, not every case is the same, but she has that little recession up on number seven. So when I showed her the photo of back then and now, I said, look how much destruction you've done. Do you think you need to wear a guard? She's like, yeah, can you make me a new one? Okay, got a few minutes left. We're gonna go into cementation here. Uh, cementation is very easy. It's no different than putting in a filling, really, in my mind, or bonding in an inlay or onlay. You know, obviously, you've got someone that you've 
taken impressions of their teeth. You've prepped them. We've gone over all those things. They're in a provisional. We talked about how to take off provisionals. Uh, so when you get a porcelain restoration back from the lab, you need to make sure it's obviously etched properly. If you look at the inside of it, it should be all frosty. If it's not, if it has any of this kind of glistening area, you know that area hasn't been etched properly. You'll need to etch it yourself. So do you need to have an etching in your office? You better believe it. Uh, this is one porcelain etchant from um, Bisco. Uh, Alternate makes some, you know, there's many companies that have them, but you need to have one on hand. Uh, based on its percentage determines like how long you leave it on. In the case of this one, a nine and a half percent hydrofluoric, it's going to stay on for 90 seconds, right? Uh, so follow manufacturer's recommendations. Regardless, you need to have an etchant. Uh, Alternate's got a nice kit that comes with an etchant and a uh, silane all-in-one. It's for repairs and or for things like this. You might also need some little, um, they call them pick and sticks, these little plastic uh, sticks with a little wax on the end. You can make them just the same with some utility wax and a micro brush. Um, but nonetheless, if the lab hasn't done a good job of etching this, you may have to go back and etch. If they've etched out onto the side or you have, that area you'll be bonding to if you're not careful. So you might want to polish that area. Uh, but ideally, we want the internal aspect completely etched. From there, I use a steam cleaner to clean out the etchant and any debris. Uh, at over 100 degrees, obviously, we kill all the bugs. Uh, so that's why I like using it to kill and clean everything off. After it's been etched, we need to make sure it's properly treated with a silane chemistry. You can either use two bottle systems or a single bottle system. You can see them here. Many manufacturers make them from Bisco to Premier to Sultan, you know, a lot of brands out there. Two bottle system has longer shelf life. That's the main thing to understand, right? If you do a lot of veneers, the single ones work great or the vials where you crack it and use it one time. The silane is applied to a etched piece of glass. And by doing so, it creates a chemical exchange that you get a bonding of resin to the ceramic. Without that, you don't get as good of a bond. You have an organic and inorganic material trying to combine together. So you need a silane coupling agent, okay? Now, if you've done that, you've got to try things in, obviously. So the teeth, after you remove the provisionals, you have to clean them and then use a water-soluble try-in paste. Don't use water. You have to use a water-soluble try-in paste. If you use water, usually the water will instantly leach out from behind the veneer and you'll get a false appearance. It'll look whiter than it really will be. You want a clear gel behind it that doesn't influence the color change that allows you to visualize it, okay? If you wanna make a slight color change with an opacious resin cement, you can, but it's a minimal change at best. Majority of color is gonna come from the veneer. If you need to clean the teeth, obviously you can use a number of different things. I have these from Whitmix, they're known as preppies. There's no fluoride in them. It's just straight flour pumice and water. So it won't contaminate anything. If you want to use a little Danville micro etcher, you can use those too. But if you hit the gums and it starts bleeding, you're going to have a very difficult time trying to deliver that case. So I don't recommend it typically. This is another device that I do like using. This is from Kerr Habe. It's known as OptiClean. It's literally like kind of like little rubber points almost that you can just rub on the tooth structure with a slow speed handpiece and it removes any debris. These are nice, again, unless you hit the gum tissue. Okay. So if we've cleaned the tooth, we're trying things on with a water soluble try-in paste. This is just you know, two teeth in this case. We allow the patient to take a look, make sure everything fits properly. If we have to do any adjustments in a proximal, we can make adjustments before gluing things in to make sure things fit properly. If I have to adjust, what I'm using personally is alternates kit. Uh, the one on the right typically is what I use. So I have to use a straight hand piece in the operatory, but I like these because they're big. And because they're big, I can't ditch or create problems as opposed to having a large surface area that can run real slowly with electric handpiece and take just a small amount of porcelain away if necessary. Uh, it's nothing against the small kit they have for the, the high speed. I just find that I burn through that really quickly. I don't get as much uh, value out of it personally. All right, so that's how I adjust my ceramic in approximately if necessary. Obviously, it goes from coarse to fine. Do I have to start with coarse? No. I can start with the yellow medium if it's just a tiny adjustment, okay? So after I've you know, tried it in the mouth, it's contaminated. I need to go back and uh, steam clean it again. I don't have to necessarily go back and silenate it, but I have to steam clean it, okay? So now we've got the teeth. And so again, it's, it's just like bonding in a composite. 
you isolate, keep it dry. Don't get any contaminants on there. As far as uh, cements, you've got light cured and dual cured materials. Because it's a veneer, you only want to use light cured product. You do not want to use dual cured because it'll start setting up on you as you're trying to put other ones in. In addition, dual cures have a higher degree of color shift over time because of the amine reaction typically. And so you're going to get discoloration in your veneers over time. So you want a color stable, light curable material. What's a good alternative to steam cleaning? Uh, you can use an acetone or alcohol water bath. So your ultrasonic water bath, you can drop them in a little uh, Ziploc bag with a little alcohol or acetone, drop it in water bath, let it sit in there for a few minutes uh, and agitate out uh, everything that's there. Uh, okay, so we've got this isolated with a Ivaclar Obtergate as well as some Mylar strips uh, because a lot of times I'm on enamel, uh, I'll etch and I don't wanna etch the adjacent teeth to create more difficulty on cleanup. So after following manufactured protocol, of placing etchant and rinsing it off. I then follow their protocols uh, as far as applying my bonding agent. You'll notice the teeth are, are dry at this point. I'm highlighting that if you put bonding agent on, it should, use, it should look shiny, kind of glossy, kind of runny, right? Put a lot on. Don't skimp here after all the work you've done. Put extra on. It has to work and penetrate. You can then evaporate off the volatile solvent and blow off all the extra with your air water syringe, right? Uh, obviously, you don't want pooling, but you want to make sure this is impenetrated into the tooth extremely well. All right. Once you've done that, it should have a nice shiny appearance, kind of like a shrink wrap appearance. And then you can hit that with your curing light. Okay. Some people ask at this point, do I have to hit it with a curing light right now? You don't have to. You certainly can wait. There's a slight benefit to it as far as getting that first layer to be bonded to the tooth. Okay. But if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Uh, Back when we had uh, different, different resin materials, we used to sandwich it all together and cure it all as one. And it worked fine. That was back in the, uh, the 90s. But uh, nowadays, as thin as the film thickness is for most of the uh, universal systems, you can cure it ahead of time. But if you're uncertain or you have a, a thick film thickness, do not cure it ahead of time because your veneer will not seat. Hence, back in the day, we had thick film thicknesses with something like an Optibon FL, uh, you did not want to cure that ahead of time because your veneer wouldn't seat properly. Okay. So you got to know what material you're using. Uh, someone asked, do I use Teflon teeth or Teflon tape on adjacent teeth instead of mylar strips? Yeah, I do that too. Sometimes it just depends if I've got a diastema or, or a, a interproxima that has been cut through, obviously the mylar strip won't stay. So I jump to Teflon, um, but where it's a tight contact Teflon, usually I can't get through. I'll use uh, the mylar strip instead. So great question. Okay. Um, the veneer itself, well, the veneer's sitting there ready to go. I didn't have to silenate it again after steam cleaning. As I said, if you silenate it once in the beginning, that's fine. If you want to put silane on it again, you can, that's not a problem. From there, a little unfilled resin, uh, you'll notice I'm putting that on there. And all this is doing is allowing it to act like a surfactant. So when I put the resin on, the resin flows easily on the porcelain. You don't want this thick. You want just an extremely thin little amount to act as a lubricant, okay? Now, I personally load my veneers with the cement. I use translucent 99% of the time. What you'll find if you use any other color and you sandwich it thin between two glass slabs, you'll find the color doesn't really impart any color change. So hence the majority of time it's translucent. Um, but nonetheless, I put it in the veneers and carry the veneer to the tooth. I know some dentists like to put it on the teeth and then squish it together. I wanna to make sure I got a bunch in that veneer and seat it on the tooth personally. You'll notice there's a bunch of excess that comes out. That's what I wanna see. I wanna see excess you know, all the way around all the margins. From here with all this excess, you've got a few options. We're almost done here. You can either tack cure it and start to clean off the excess, but I would not clean off all the excess personally. Because if you clean off all the excess, now you have to put an air inhibition barrier over your margin so you don't get that discoloration. Or if you try to clean the margin up to completion, you may pull some of the resin out of your margin. Now you have a defect, which is going to collect debris and stain and look funny. Okay. So again, technique determines if it's going to look funny or not. I do not floss these. I do not clean off all the excess. I personally do not tack cure things. I go in with a big curing light. I use the ultra dent um, Velo Grand, and it has this large 12 millimeter head size. And so I will use this to 
my, myself and the assistant, when I have all of them in place, I've cleaned off maybe 80% of the excess at the gum line. I've left the rest of the excess. I have not flossed. I've left it, which means I got a bear, you know, more time to clean up stuff. But we'll both just go across and hit each tooth for like five seconds. So they're kind of tacked in place, but they're tacked in their entirety. And this light is so strong and penetrates so deeply that I've got a really good cure in place. Um, so after they're all kind of hit for five seconds, I'll then go back and hit them again for longer. But I want to kind of hit them all real quickly just to make sure they're all held in place. Uh, so this device is phenomenal. It'll cure all your resins out there and has great penetration, whether you're using zirconia or Emacs or Feldspathic. If you drop it, it's not a problem. It's one solid piece of aluminum. You can't break it. It's phenomenal. I think it's got like a five or seven year life or five or seven year uh, guarantee on it. It's pretty amazing. The other thing is it uses rechargeable batteries, the same that are in my camera. So I can swap out batteries instantly if for some reason it needs to be recharged. I just swap a battery. So very inexpensive, very easy to use. I love this device. Now you go, okay, well, you got that excess you said you left behind. How do you clean that up? Well, there's a couple of ways. I go in with these interproximal saws, these Jiffy saws from Ultradent. I also use these contact EZs, which in certain places where I need like to not cut their lip, and maybe on the premolars, these small ones, I can go in easily without damaging the lip versus the long Jiffy saws. Now, as far as excess at the gum line, if you have a nice margin, you have good approximation, usually I can break that off with like a gold foil knife or a periodontal knife or a hygiene instrument. If I can't, same as before, I'll go in with either a 12 or 24 fluted carbide. The more flutes, the less ability you have to damage porcelain. If you have a 24 flute, it's very hard to damage porcelain. If you have a 12 flute, there's a chance if you push too hard, you could damage the porcelain. So you gotta be careful. Okay. But I know that my margin has resin to completion with no air, air inhibition layer that I know I'm not gonna have problems down there over time. Someone asked, in what order do you cement if I'm doing, uh, let's say, six upper teeth? I put all six in at once, and I cure them all at once. I know some people out there do one tooth at a time. I've tried that, and I found more often than not, you end up with problems trying to get them to seat. So I personally don't, but I know a lot of people do. Okay? So you know, trial and error, you find out what works for you best, but I find this works the easiest for me. Okay, so there, obviously there's your final after cleaning off the excess. You know, so it looks the same as the Triumph. No surprises. She knows what she was getting. All right. We're just about done here. I got like four slides left. Obviously, there's a lot more to discuss, but I think I've given you a lot of basics and a lot of thoughts and a lot of pearls as far as how you can achieve some success in doing these and to make it so it's a simple approach and it's not scary. Okay. And so success comes from obviously practicing, taking time to talk to people and relay information so that you all know where you're going. Uh, okay, someone was asking, which do I put in first? Yeah, so I'll seat the centrals first and move laterally, but it's all cured at the same time. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you go from back to front, but I usually start front and go to back. I mentioned earlier, doing more cases has a lot to do with attracting the right customers and converting them. Then you finally get to deliver and do the work. So those are two things you need to think about working on. With enough practice, these procedures become easy, right? You can see that. It's not that challenging. How do you get to practice these procedures? How do you get better at these procedures? It's by getting more patients to do them. So you've got to learn how to attract them and get them to move forward. Otherwise, you never get to do these fun things, right? Now, as dentists, you know, we're going to have trial and error. And the only way you can really over, overcome that is by practice. And as I mentioned, if you're practicing everyday preparations, if you're practicing weekly, at least uh, doing preparations and provisionals, you'll find that on a model, you get pretty good. And then when it comes time to do it in the patient's mouth, you go, oh, it's no brainer. It's really easy. But most habits are going to take a while to get used to. Right? So I throw in this. We do an online program. It's a hands-on program. That you can have your own models and do your own thing, or you can get our kit and, and work along with us. But we go through in great detail for 30 days, all the little steps, and we get you to do things along with us and hold you accountable. And we give you a lot of extra information as far as legal documentation. And we dive deeper into materials and some of the techniques and whatnot. So you're very comfortable by the time it's done. Okay? But I think the hands-on component makes it really interesting that you get to go along with us at the same time and practice each step. Okay, so I throw that out there. 
I mentioned a handout. There's a handout waiting for you. Every slide I just showed you is there for you to reference. So if you're going to do a case and you want to reference back to it, everything's there for you. Where do you get the handout? You get it at dentools.com, D-E-N-T-O-O-L-Z.com. This is really the only slide you need to take a photo of because everything else you'll have in the form of a digital PDF handout. Now, when you go to Dentools, you go to this page, put in your name and your email, and you will get an email sent back to your email. So make sure you put it in properly. And if you do that, you will get a, a hidden page on my website that has all my handouts. If you want to ask me comments or questions, go ahead and put it here on that page. You can see where it says comments and questions. If you want to see my lecture schedule, if you want to follow on social media, the links are at the top of the page. Now, when you get that email sent back to you, if you don't see it, it's probably in your junk mail. You better check. When you get to this page, there are probably at least 15 handouts from lectures I've done in the last couple of months and or webinars. You're welcome to download anything and everything. Right? You'll notice on each one of these lectures, there's a little blue thing that says, click here for the handout. You'll see it right here under each one. You click on that, it downloads a PDF handout of every slide I showed you. Okay, so very easy for you to get that. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I get two questions that came in. Uh, good. Here's a good one. I'll, I'll hit this one real quick because I know we got to go. Um, if bleeding occurs after curing while cleaning off excess, what do you do to achieve hemostasis to prevent discoloration? Well, here's the catch. If you go in and try to clean up excess before you cure things and blood gets underneath, you got to stop and start over. That's a bear. Hence, I don't clean up stuff, right? Uh, I may wipe uh, like 80% of the gross excess off way away from the veneer where it's not going to cause any bleeding, you know, with a little micro brush. But if you're causing bleeding and you didn't cure everything, you've got a problem. Hence, I do not tack cure and try and clean things up. I do not try to wipe everything away. I never have a problem with that because I cure everything as one big glob, right? And then I clean it off afterwards. So if bleeding occurs afterwards, there's no way to get underneath. And that's why I do it the way I do, which means it takes a little more effort, but I never run into that problem. Okay. All right. Um, I'm out of time. So I, I appreciate all the questions. Obviously, you can ask me more questions as I said on Den Tools. If you want to do 30 days with me and the rest of the group inside of Legion with our veneer program with hands-on and daily interaction, go dive deeper into everything and create habits for yourself please feel free to join us at legion.dentist. It's under the armory section. Okay. Thanks again for everyone coming out. Appreciate all the interaction, all the great questions you have. I wish you the best in your career. I look forward to seeing you again on another uh, webinar or live program. Thanks again for your time.